Of all the photos you brought here today, why is this image of Geronimo important? Well, any image of Geronimo would be important mm -hmm. because he was such a pivotal figure in, in history of the West. Uh, ben Wittick was a very interesting guy. He came from Illinois. He came out here to work for the railroads, documenting trains, um, you know, railroads being built. That was his entree. And Geronimo at that point in time was like the most famous man in the West probably. And Geronimo was not shy about having his photograph taken. In fact, he charged people. Mm -hmm. I did not know that. He would charge them. And there is, a, there is a story about how, depending on how he got along or what, how he felt about mm -hmm. people, we'd charge them more. <laughs> the John Gall meme photographs are some of the earliest photos taken here in New Mexico. Can you tell us the story behind these photos? Well, it's interesting. They're not photographs by John Gall meme. Uh, John Gall meme is, you know, the famous New Mexico architect. He actually bought the album in New York City in the 1930s and brought it back to New Mexico where it sort of gained a lot of notoriety because it does represent some of the earliest photography in New Mexico and documents the long walk. And tell us about the Redondo picture. Can you kind of unpack what we see in this image? Well, this particular one, there's no annotation for any of these images. These are glass plate negatives which have been lost to time. So there's no documentation on who's doing what. Mm -hmm. All we know is that these are the Navajo captives and Apache captives too okay. at Bosque Redondo. We know that the military was there. Um, beyond that, there really isn't any context for what's in the photographs other than we know what happened at that point in time. And so did the Navajo thieves image come from this era? These photographs were taken at Bosque Redondo. Um, and if you do a little analysis of the album and you look at it, you can see the backdrops even props like blankets over, uh, over, you know, like a stool or something, mm -hmm. they show up repeatedly in these photographs. Wow. So at some point in time, probably an Army Signal Corps photographer showed up at Bosque Redondo with his little traveling mm -hmm. studio set up, put up a chair, threw up a couple of blankets, and then would grab people and put them in, in, in this setup. Mm -hmm. So like this particular image that we're looking at here, same kind of thing. You can see those blankets reoccur mm -hmm. from time to time. Tell us a little bit about the image that was taken um, on the plaza in Santa Fe. That's a, a photograph of the west side of the plaza, mm -hmm. and there's corn mm -hmm. growing on the plaza. <laughs> Very pragmatic approach yeah. to, you know, urban farming, I right. guess. But those photographs, early photographs of, like, Santa Fe, kind of like time travel. Mm -hmm. You look at this and you <laughs> think, that is so strange. Yeah. It doesn't look anything like that now. Right. Tell us a little bit about the stereo image that was taken in Santa Fe from the west side. I, we think it's taken from the top of St. Michael's College. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that building today in Santa Fe, but the top floor burned. Mm -hmm. It used to be a three-story mm -hmm. building. So from up there, you could take a photograph overlooking the city of Santa Fe. And when you look at this, what do you see? You see there's a lot of agriculture going yeah. on here, all these plots. Mm -hmm. Not like today, where it's second homes, condominiums. Mm -hmm. This was, it was a practical environment. I like bird's eye views because they sort of transcend kind of an idea of taking a standard photograph where you're standing on the ground. Mm -hmm. So that perspective of looking out over the rooftops is something that was really, you know, the very first photograph ever taken looks out over the rooftops of France, of Paris. Right. You know, so it's the same kind of mentality. You look out your window, this is what you see. Can you tell us a little bit about Gardner's photo and why this image is important to you? Number one, you have probably one of the most famous Civil War photographers mm -hmm. all of a sudden transports himself from the battlefields of Virginia and Pennsylvania to El Moro mm -hmm. out by Zuni. Now this is a wet, place pro wet plate process. So here he is, he's got this probably some sort of wagon, some sort of device. He has to pour his emulsion on glass, mm -hmm. smooth it around, take the image, go back and develop it right away. So you're doing that if you've ever been over at El Moro, mm -hmm. it can be kind of a harsh environment. Right. So you have to give these early pioneer photographers a lot of credit because the process was difficult mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it just, it took a lot of patience. Mm -hmm. So the fact that Andrew Gardner ended up here and takes this photograph of El Moro, I think is interesting. Yeah. We don't think of people in the 1870s of being that fluid. Mm -hmm. But it shows a lot of perseverance, this determination to capture right. that image. Yeah. 
So speaking of early photographs, can you tell us a little bit about uh, this Hiller photograph? If you look at this photograph, you wonder, where is this? And then you realize it's where we're at right now. Huh. This is a view of the Sandias from Sandia Pueblo. Hillers was an amazing photographer, very prolific. We have hundreds of landscape photographs by Hillers. And what would drive people like this to go out? And why would you go take this photograph? First, you'd have to go to the Pueblo, get permission to climb up on top of somebody's house mm -hmm. and take this photograph. And a medium that you know people weren't familiar with. So it's, I find people like Hillers really interesting. Nussbaum, Parkhurst were also photographers like that. They made a point of going out and capturing these everyday scenes, which are just incredibly valuable in terms of studying the history of New Mexico today. Tell me about the history of the photographic method, especially that of the daguerreotype. Well, the daguerreotype uh, was unveiled in 1839 by, by Louis Daguerre in France, and he actually sold it to the French government for a lifetime annuity. Within a matter of like 10 years, um, New York City had 51 daguerreotype studios in like 1850. So at that point in time, that'd be the equivalent of today, Albuquerque, if you can imagine Albuquerque having 51 portrait studios. It'd be the same kind of saturation because it was so new and it, it uh, supplanted painting. The, the clarity, the crispness, the, the tonal scales in it are just phenomenal. And this is a one, one of a kind. You know, there, there's only one. Tell us a little bit more about these plates and how they were cared for by the individual. Well, because it is on a plate, it's a burnished metal plate, it will corrode. So the way that you kept that from uh, doing that is you put them in these little cases. Right. So they're essentially hermetically sealed cases, but had two purposes, one to preserve the photograph and two to make them portable. Mm -hmm. So some of the smaller photographs like this would be of a husband, of a wife, of children, and they would carry them around. Particularly during the Civil War, this was a really big deal. When dad goes off to the war, you go down to the daguerreotype studio and you get a, a photograph of him, which the wife kept. You take a picture of the wife and the husband would take that with him. Right. So some of the case images we have in the photo archives, like, like this these, one here, correct? Yeah, these small uh, daguerreotypes would end up in somebody's pocket or in their back. Now is this in a daguerreotype here or is this? This is the... a daguerreotype. Okay. You can usually tell daguerreotype uh, because there's almost always a little bit of corrosion around mm -hmm. the edges. They're almost like, like holograms. Right. You have to kind of look at them like this in light and you get the light in just the right direction and it just sort of magically right. appears. <laughs> How long do you think people have spent um, creating the pinhole photography? Well, pinhole photography goes back to like 4000 BC or something, or 400 BC. The Chinese, there's a Chinese philosopher who talked about capturing images in caves and things like mm -hmm. that. So pinhole photography is a really interesting process. One of the most famous pinhole photographs is the one taken by Julian Mack at the first atomic bomb explosion at White Sands. Now this fellow, Julian Mack, was the guy that was in charge of all sorts of spectrometer kind of light reading, so very highly technical equipment at the site. So when the bomb goes off, what does he do? He pulls out a pinhole camera <laughs> and takes like the most untechnical photograph you could imagine of the first atomic bomb explosion. This is the Palace of the Governors. How was this image created? Well, <clears throat> there's a little backstory to this. The largest collection of pinhole photography lives right here in New Mexico at the Palace of the Governors photo archive. Right, and this is a pinhole photo. This is a pinhole photograph. Okay. So this photograph was taken when the uh, Poetics of Light pinhole exhibit was up. And uh, Heather from Heather Oakless from Colorado has a box truck that's basically a portable pinhole photo studio. So we pulled this van, it's probably like <laughs> a 16 foot van or box truck in front of the palace. There was a tiny pinhole on the north side of it and on the opposing wall were 84 eight by 10 sheets of photo paper that we put on the wall with little magnets and you can see those in there. So this is about a three hour exposure wow. of the front of the Palace of the Governors. And because it's direct onto photo paper, you get the negative result.
Why are you so fascinated by the magic that is photography? I'm by nature a visual person. I, I relate to things visually more than I do any other way. So for me to look at photographs, like we were talking about earlier, what would compel someone to take a photograph? Like, other than the backstory I just gave you, why would somebody do this? Mm -hmm. Why would they capture this? For a number of reasons. A, it's the center of Santa Fe. B, because it's the palace of the governors. C, because they're just showing off, mm -hmm. you know? So that whole idea, why did Hillers go down and take that photograph of Sandia Pueblo? What was, what was in it for him? Who, how many people in New Mexico at that point in time wanted to buy a photograph of Sandia Pueblo? So while there may have been a commercial intent, I think it's just the sheer joy of creating photographs that makes a lot of people do what they do. How do these images help tell our history? A picture t is worth a thousand words, so if that's the case, if you look at a typical photo archive, you've got a few billion words worth of stuff mm -hmm. lying around in there. So, um, but photography ha provides a, a sort of a really crucial role in society today. Historically speaking, it would have been the storytellers who, who carry on tradition and, and, and document historical uh, myths, whatever it would be. Photography now does that with the, with um, everybody now is a photographer with a cell phone. <laughs> everybody has a, their data is full because there's photographs in there, so many photographs. And some of them are quite good. So why is that so important that those photos exist for us today? Here we are today sitting here talking about mm -hmm. it. It's like the old saying goes, if your name is spoken a thousand years after you're dead, you still live. Mm -hmm. So it's the same thing with photography. You look at a photograph like this daguerreotype here, she's still alive. Mm -hmm. because we can see her. Mm -hmm. So photography has that kind of element to it. It's magic. Right, right. Plain and simple, it's magic. And poetic magic, right? It's so poetic in the sense that it keeps history right. alive. Right. Even the pinhole photographs of the palace, it takes a while to figure out what's going on there. You know, so you look at it and you stare at it and you spend some time with it and all of a sudden it kind of yeah. comes into focus, so to speak. Right. And so these images kind of make you think therefore connect you to those individuals or those places? It's an artifact, you know, it's, it's, uh, photographs are artifacts. They're artifacts that are another place in time or another person, somebody who's long gone. We are all caretakers of history on one level or another. Everybody plays a role in, in uh, creating our history. Mm -hmm. So family photographs, even though you think that they're just family photographs, would have a historical importance if they were in an archive where they could be preserved and, created ac and create access for people. Mm -hmm.